Greetings, sisters and brothers. Welcome to episode 57 of African History Club. I'm your host, Milton Alimadi. Thank you for your support, as always. I also wanted to give a quick update before I begin today's uh, podcast, series number 57. We have started the Summer African History Lectures. It's not really a lecture. I hate to use that term because it's very interactive. So we had our first session last week, Saturday, and our second session is tomorrow, Saturday. We're going to have a total of 10. Uh, last week, we discussed the works of uh, Czech Anta Job, and tomorrow we will focus on Walter Rodney and the late professor, Dr. John Hendrick Clark, and we will also focus on a documentary from Al Jazeera, which dealt with the so-called scramble for Africa, the Berlin Conference of November 1884, February 1885, when the African continent was partitioned by the European powers of the day. So we have, in our first session, we had about 10 students, uh, participants rather, a total of 14 had enrolled, but a couple of them had to attend some protest last week. So I think we will have our full roster of 14 tomorrow. Obviously, if anyone is still interested in joining us, you can reach me via email, malimadi, that's M-A-L-L-I-M-A-D-I, at gmail.com, and I'll send you all the details and the information. So today, this month, June, is the first year anniversary of publication of my book, Manufacturing Hate, How Africa Was Demonized in Western Media. This is the book published last June by Kendall Hunt Publishing Company, and I'll speak into the book, the motivation for writing the book, and some of the history. But I just want to give you a little read from this blurb. This is part of a review from Kirkus, Kirkus Review. Quote, in this disturbing and compelling account of Western media's inglorious coverage of Africa, John Jay College adjunct, professor, and Black Star News publisher, Alimadi reveals how, quote, demonization of Africans was the handmaiden of conquest and colonization, end quote. They are notorious, or so I hear, <laughs> for harsh reviews, but they wrote a pretty decent review, actually. And it goes on, of course. I'm just reading a little bit of it. And if you're interested, you can also look that up. Just Google Kirkus Reviews and Manufacturing Hate and it will pop up. And also I bring this obviously because a book like this that really takes on the established publications such as the New York Times, such as National Geographic, Time Magazine, and Newsweek, when you take them head on, it is almost impossible, or at least very difficult to get the so-called corporate mainstream publications to review a book like this. And were we not living in an era of social media and online publications, it would have been very difficult or near impossible for anyone to hear anything about this book. So obviously, I am thankful that at least we got a lot of interviews done on social media and uh, online platforms concerning the book. So it did uh, gain some traction. Obviously, I would like it to gain more attention. And for uh, any one of you uh, who may be interested in getting the book after my presentation today, you can get it through, uh, via Amazon, or better yet, you can also encourage your bookstore or library or book club to order it directly from the publisher, Kendall Hunt Publishing Company. And their number is 800 344 9034. And as I said uh, in a previous 
uh, podcast, I'll be happy to discuss the book with anybody online, more than happy to do online readings or even in-person readings, provided the proper precautions and social distancing are observed. All right, so first of all, the motivation for writing this book. Initially, it was not even to write a book, really, and I'll tell you the story behind it. I think I've told part of the story before. I am born in Uganda, but grew up also in Tanzania. Actually went to high school in Tanzania. And I started reading a lot when I was about 11, 12 years old. Publications from all over the world. And I was always infuriated at how Africans and African settings were always tribalized, depicted as the other. Even as a young boy, I felt that but there wasn't much I could do. I eventually came to study in the United States. I went to Syracuse for my undergrad degree. And I remember one class in particular. It was a freshman English class. And the professor was speaking in highly glorious terms about Joseph Conrad and Heart of Darkness. And yet the passages that he was reading you know, really gave me goosebumps and a chill. Uh, some of the most disturbing, ugly descriptions of Africans and the vegetation itself, the African setting, it, it, it bothered me tremendously. Uh, but at that point, I was not intellectually equipped to challenge the professor and to say there was something wrong, particularly when the rest of the class uh, was similarly absorbed in the book and seemed to be quite as elated as the professor himself was. Uh, I did not have the opportunity to do something until many years later when I attended the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia. And then you get to select a master's project. So for my master's project, I decided to look at representations of Africa and Africans in Western media, Western literature. So while I started doing research about newspapers, I found out that the New York Times, of course, had some of the richest archives, dating back to some of the earliest articles about Afra, Africa that I discovered dated to 1877, when an editorial in the New York Times was calling on England to colonize the African continent before Germany could get to do it. And I also started noting the very offensive and racist demonization. So for example, the editorial said Africans were not fully human beings and were somehow affiliated with the crocodile and ancient hippopotamus. I really don't know what that even means, <laughs> but clearly. Uh, to indicate that Africans are not uh, human beings, unlike uh, Europeans. Uh, so I read the articles in the New York Times dating from that era all the way uh, to the 1990s, because that's when uh, he was at the journalism school at Columbia. And then I was lucky to have discovered something very interesting when I continued my research and went to the archives of the New York Times, I found very many racist and offensive correspondences exchanged between editors here in New York and reporters sent uh, to Africa. At that time, particularly to cover decolonization from European colonial rule in the late 1950s and in the 1960s. So I compiled all that information together, uh, showing the correlation between the privately expressed racism in their letters and the articles that were published in the paper, in the New York Times, purporting to be uh, news articles. Um, and I put together my master's project. The paper, the master's paper, won an award called the James Wechsler Memorial Prize um, in International Writing while I was at the J School. 
and Columbia Journalism Review invited me to submit my paper for uh, publication as an article. They uh, went through the editing. They even had it in galley form, and eventually they backed out of publishing the, uh, the paper. And they actually did me a favor. And I found out why they backed out, because I demanded to get my paper back. And I found that they had written in the beginning of the paper sort of an, an apology <laughs> to the New York Times, saying that the paper was not meant to be uh, a criticism of the New York Times, but essentially to show how um, every media outlet could go astray. And there you have it. So I found the evidence that they were actually afraid of how the New York Times might react. I did their favor. I did them a favor. I sent a copy to the New York Times. And after that, I corresponded with who was then the managing editor and later executive editor named Joseph Ludeville. But I also made an offer to the New York Times. I say, now that I've unearthed this ugly past that you had, I am, really, I am offering to write an op-ed uh, to put it in perspectives and suggest perhaps um, how you could go forward. And that offer was not accepted. But that experience really, uh, and I also actually relay, uh, relate this account that I just offered in the book itself, in the introduction uh, to my book. But they actually probably did me a favor because initially, I don't believe I had any plans to write uh, an entire book. Perhaps if the magazine piece had been published, uh, I might have been contacted by an editor. I, oh, I, I may have decided to develop that uh, as a book proposal. But that had not been initially the idea when I wrote the master's project. But that experience definitely motivated me further because I did not feel that this history uh, should be suppressed. So I expanded my research. I did more readings into the accounts that preceded even professional journalists that started writing about Africa. So I read the books of the so-called explorers, the Europeans who went to Africa. Basically, these were scouts for imperialism. They were mapping out the boundaries, they were mapping out the uh, resource locations, and they were evaluating the African people, their level of potential resistance um, to what then was to happen much later, which was the conquest and colonization of Africa. So now in starting to read those accounts, I started focusing more on the political aspect of the racism. It was not racist depiction just for the sake of being racist. <laughs> the racism was actually uh, very critical in, as, as, um, as the account that I read in the review, the Kirkus Review suggests, the racism had a very specific purpose, which was to delegitimize the humanity of Africans and to make it easier for the European populations to accept the exploitation of Africans. And this type of racism, of course, was also very effectively used uh, during enslavement, uh, the, the enslavement uh, era, when Africans first had to be uh, dehumanized to make it acceptable for people to be treated like, like cattle during uh, chattel slavery, the slave trade itself, and so on. So that's how I started um, examining and examining uh, this relationship and the analysis. So for example, in 1866, let's take James Baker, a British explorer who traveled in much of uh, East and Central Africa. So he writes a section, just pure demonization of Africans, <laughs> you know, brutes, savages, and says Africans should not be compared to the noble character of the dog. And he laments that slavery 
uh, was ever abolished and so forth. But then in another section, he's uh, praising the economic potential and possibilities of engaging uh, in trade between uh, Europeans and the African continent. So that was the true objective. And then when I went back and started reading the articles, the past articles in the New York Times as well, there was a similar pattern where the demonization occurs and then um, that then offers the rationalization for economic exploitation because these savages really don't know what they're sitting on after all. Uh, so even the articles that I had used or researched when I was a graduate student at Columbia, when I now went back to those articles, I could see a lot more, much more than I saw when I was doing my research uh, for my master's uh, paper. Uh, it was obviously the case when I read that editorial from 1877, the racism and then the justification, the call for colonization. Uh, let me read another article from the New York Times, part of it at least. This is from February 2nd, 1890, celebrating the conquest of Eritrea, which had been part of Ethiopia. And this is during the era of Emperor Menelik II and Empress Tetu. So the Times wrote, this is part of it, quote, we may rejoice in and applaud this conquest of civilization and Christianity over barbarians and savages, over unbelief, over habits of ferocity, over brutal ignorance of every human law, religious, social, and civil, which in the case of many African countries was of course nonsense. In the case specifically of Ethiopia, absolutely nonsense. Ethiopia um, had an empire which had existed uh, prior to the Ethiopian empire, the uh, successor of the Aksum empire, which had existed uh, uh, before the Christian era and had reached its height in the third century of the Christian era and then from there on evolved as the Ethiopian Empire and had adopted Christianity from the third century. So this was utter nonsense, of course, uh, purely propaganda. But here is a much more interesting part. In that same article, the true motives, the economic motives behind this Italian war of aggression is revealed, which the New York Times is celebrating. So now it adds toward the end of the article, quote, the water roads of Africa and the large commercial arteries in the hands of Italy signify that they are also in the hands of, in the hands of the civilized world, which can now introduce without fear the benefits of commerce, of exchange, of relations of any and every sort, and in short time produce the best profits from the immense natural resources existing there. So there you have it. Demonization, and then followed by rationalization for the economic exploitation. And that essentially is the methodology that I applied in my book. Um, and sadly, the demonization became a pattern. It became uh, so well used and applied toward Africa that the continent that actually uh, is the origin of human beings that had some of the earliest cultures, including Kemet, ancient Egypt, and that had all these empires that flourished in the early part of the Christian era before nations such as uh, England even existed, yet somehow became the epitome of backwardness and barbarism uh, because of this historical demonization in um, Western media. I want to now jump forward 
to the period when publications such as the New York Times started sending professional writers to Africa. And now you will see why it's difficult for a book like this to be reviewed widely, because there is a fear by many uh, at how the New York Times would react to some of this material being revealed, which I actually did not <laughs> make up, but found in the archives of the New York Times during my research. So for example, when the New York Times sent a reporter named Homer Bigart, who had already won the Pulitzer Prize twice, he had won it actually, I think, when he was with the Herald Tribune, before he joined the New York Times. So the Times sends him to Africa to cover decolonization. And he goes to Ghana, and he's not impressed, and he makes sure his editor knows about it. His editor's name was Emmanuel Friedman. So Big Art writes from uh, Ghana and sends it, uh, this letter to his editor here in New York. Quote, I'm afraid I cannot work up any enthusiasm for the emerging republics. End quote. He wrote in an undated letter to Friedman from Africa. Quote, quote, the politicians are either crooks or mystics. Dr. Nkrumah is a Henry Wallace in burnt cork. I vastly prefer the primitive bush people. After all, cannibalism may be the logical antidote to this population explosion everyone talks about, end quote. Big Art's favorite terms for describing the Africans he wrote about were, quote, barbaric, end quote, quote, macabre, end quote, quote, grotesque, end quote, and quote, savage, end quote. The contempt for Africa that he wrote openly about to freedmen was also conveyed in what were published in the Times purporting to be news articles. And then I go on to show how, in some instances, he manufactured incidents uh, that had not occurred in Africa and included it in his story, or his editors did, uh, and subsequently published purporting to be uh, articles from Africa. And I also want to read a little bit to assess the mindset of the editor himself. So here is also directly from the book. Friedman in New York was evidently delighted with this type of, quote, journalism, end quote, by Big Art from Africa. Quote, this is just a note to say hello and to tell you how much your peerless prose from the Badlands is continuing to give us and your public. Friedman wrote to Big Art in a letter dated March 4, 1960. Quote, by now, you must be American journalism's leading expert on sorcery, witchcraft, cannibalism, and all the other exotic phenomena indigenous to darkest Africa. All this and nationalism, too? Where else but in the New York Times can you get all this for a nickel? End quote. Okay, so now, my initial impression was depraved outpourings of a depraved editor, a depraved uh, journalist? Hardly, because I went to see what was published, and there was consistently a perfect correlation between the ugly language in what purported to be news articles and the, uh, the views expressed in the letters, a uh, part of that, uh, which I just read right now. And uh, I continued my research. I actually found a letter from a reporter named Lloyd Garrison, a descendant of the great abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison. And Garrison wrote to his editors in New York. He was covering the, uh, the war in uh, Nigeria when Biafra tried to secede from the Nigerian Federation. And he sent a letter complaining to his editors here in New York. Why? Because they had inserted a scene purporting <laughs> something he did not write himself, a scene about primitive Nigerians dressed in grass leaf skirts, manufactured out of thin air <laughs> by the editors here in New York and inserted into what purported to be a news article. And here you find the New York Times reporter himself 
complaining in a letter to his editors. And that is the kind of material that I was able to find from the New York Times archives and I also include in this book. Now, obviously this kind of depiction, it has a legacy. So for example, there's still this recurring theme, this recurring practice of talking about tribalism in Africa. When Africans in Africa talk about my tribe or that tribe, it has a very different meaning to when Europeans or Americans depict Africans that way. They simply want to distinguish that I am Igbo, I am Yoruba, I am Kikuyu, I am Acholi, and I am Baganda, Buganda, Muganda, and so on. But not to suggest that they are inferior to anybody. Although this kind of depiction also develops an inferiority complex, which is something I also discuss in the book, and it also develops a repudiation, a rejection of African heritage by people of African descent, even in here in the United States. And Malcolm X talked about that as well, uh, how the colonial powers used that to separate African Americans from their African sisters and brothers. And I discussed that uh, in the book as well. So before I wrap up, let me just make two additional points. <clears throat> in December 2020, the New York Times did a long article about a story about the Kansas City Star. The Kansas City Star had actually apologized for its past depictions of the black citizens of Kansas, historically, the racist depictions. And the Times did an article about that apology. And yet the Times has never mentioned that it also has its own ugly legacy. Right here in the United States as well. That's not the subject of my book. That's a subject that I'm dealing with in the future. But it also has this ugly legacy in Africa as well. Documented, partly thanks to the material from their own archives. So when my book came out last year, somebody advised me to send a copy to some of the book reviewers in the Times. I was skeptical, but I sent it nevertheless. And I also wrote to the publisher, C.G. Salzberger, and I sent him a copy of the book as well. And I said, now that the Times has published an article about the apology by the Kansas City Star, I think it would be appropriate for the Times to also own up to its past depiction, demonization of Africa and Africans, and to also apologize for that. No response from the publisher. And surprise, surprise, the book, of course, was not reviewed by the New York Times either. So I wrote to him again this year in April, and I reminded him, and I said he should still do the right thing and apologize for the Times' demonization of Africa and Africans, and by extension, descendants of Africa in this country, just as Kansas City Star had done, and the New York Times had covered that apology by the Kansas City Star. So I close on that note, once again, I call on the New York Times to do the right thing, own up to the ugly racist demonization of Africa and Africans, because it has contemporary legacies and do the right thing and apologize. And as I said, if after reading this book, you want to engage me in conversation, you want to invite me to book reading, whether in person, whether via Zoom, malimadi at gmail.com. Thank you and see you all soon.